from the 18th chapter, starting at verse 9. Jesus told his parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. For those who may be worshiping with us who are not from the Lutheran tradition, we worship and use what's called a lectionary. It means we have set readings for each Sunday through the church year. We, that church year for us begins in the season called Advent, four weeks before Christmas, and then goes all the way through the year. And this year, in this cycle of the lectionary, we've been reading in the Gospel of Luke. And so this week, while I was doing my, my sermon preparation and studying up on this reading, this interesting parable that we just heard, I came across a fascinating reading I had never read before. This comes from Father Dietrich Koldi, a German priest around the year 1500. This is what he wrote. There are three things I know to be true that frequently make my heart heavy. The first troubles my spirit because I know I'm going to die. The second troubles my heart more because I don't know when. And the third troubles me above all. I don't know where I will go. Isn't that a fascinating quote? His spirit is troubled because first he knows he's going to die. He doesn't know when. And worst of all, a priest a faithful Christian at that time didn't know where he would go. That troubles my spirit. Because the good news of God frees us from that despair. But we sure deal with that all the time, don't we? That, that question that, that he was asking, that sense of uncertainty, certainly is something we're familiar with. And we have responses to that. We have ways that we deal with that. One of the responses is, we're going to make sure we look good then. If, if I'm not sure how this is going to play out, well, I'm going to do my best. It's the idea that we might earn our way. That if we're good enough, just maybe if we're good enough, God will let us in. Good luck. It's not going to go so well. Not if that's how we're really trying to operate. Because for every time I'm really, really good, I'm also just as really, really bad. It's that reality that we can't earn our way. I once knew a man in Pennsylvania. This gentleman was mean as a rattlesnake. He was older in years. His wife had died and she was the softer person. She's the one who kind of made him tolerable to everybody else. At the point that I got to know him, he was bold enough to share with me where he stood with God. 
he made it very clear. You see, the church had burned down. The church didn't have enough money to rebuild, so he gave them $10,000. That $10,000 inspired others to give, and so they built the church back. Now, he didn't go to church, but he let me know that sealed the deal with God. That 10000 was all the ticket cost for him to go to heaven. Now, that didn't change his heart at all because he kept on being who he was. He was very nice to me. But when it came to his family, well, he died while I was there. And he named the church in the will. We got a pickup truck, an old pickup truck, a rusted old pickup truck. But in the will, the copy we got, you saw all of his family listed and all of them scratched out. He would periodically go in and just take another one off the list. I don't believe that that's the way God wants us to be. I don't believe that that's the idea that God wants us to be living into, that we have to earn our way or we can buy our way, because that's not how it works. See, the, the reality is, that how many of you have ever gone to the store and bought a really, really pretty red apple? Have you ever been, oh, that beautiful apple. It's shiny. It looks so good. You can look at it and you know what that first bite is going to be like. It's going to be juicy. It's going to be sweet. It's going to be perfect. And then you take that big old bite of the apple and by golly, that one's been sitting around a long time. And instead of being crisp and juicy and fresh and everything you hoped, it's mealy and mushy. And you can't wait to spit it out. The idea of our earning our way, of our somehow working our way up to God, is like we put that cover on that's that pretty shell, that pretty red skin of the apple, but inside it's still the same problem. In the parable tonight, the Pharisee that Jesus has in the parable, I believe, is that sort of a person. On the outside, he can list all the perfect and wonderful things he's done. He's not like other people. No, 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 no. He's done all the things he's supposed to do. Just look at the list of the good religious stuff he's checked off. They're not bad things. They're good things to do. But he's keeping a list. And then he says, oh, but I'm... I'm not like that guy over there. That's nothing but the working in a system that's trying to get yourself there for some, in some way that's not God's way. And that's the point of the parable. The point of the teaching of Jesus here is to point us to the true heart of God. And so he tells us, yes, there's another guy. And you know what? He's not a great guy. Tax collectors in that time. Or do we have any tax collectors here? Okay, because they're not the same as they used to be, just so you know. That's a noble thing now. But in that day, a tax collector was a Jewish person who was colluding with the enemy, the Roman occupiers. They collected the tax for the Roman government, and they also would take it a little bit extra to pad their own pockets. And they weren't liked. And people frankly looked at them and saw them as being sinners, let alone traitors to their own people and to God. So a tax collector comes into the temple. Now the Pharisee, he walks in and he steps, he's right comfortable stepping up right into it to let God know the tax collector, he doesn't go very far in and he won't even look to heaven, but he's beating his breast and he cries for mercy. And then Jesus says to his disciples, guess what guys? That one was the one justified. That's the one made right with God. That's the one in a right relationship with God. And here's what it rests upon. 
That tax collector knew he was unworthy. That tax collector fell into the mercy of God. That tax collector trusted God to be God. God proclaims a promise of grace. God proclaims, I love you because I am God and I choose to love you. Not because you deserve it, but because I know who you are and I do love you. God comes to us in Jesus Christ and reveals God's very heart to us. And it's a heart that accepts us not because we're good, not because we're perfect, but rather because we are God's children. And he frees us from sin, from death, from the power of the devil. He frees us by grace, by God's love for us, which is unconditional. Yet we still fall into sometimes playing that game. As long as we play a game and think we're earning or working our way, then we miss the true freedom that God has for us. God's Son has died for us and been raised for us so that we can be free to be the best person that we are. Not because we're earning something, but rather loved by God, we're filled with love for ourselves and to go love others. We can be the best that we are because we've been freed to be the best. We can live a response to God's love. We can be God's people. Not because it gets us something, but because God loves us so we can love others. I pray for you that the Word of God opens up your heart even more, calling you to trust in God's promise for you. To trust that God loves you for who you are. To trust that God forgives you of your sin and sends you back out now to live. Now, maybe you're going, this is kind of weird. I'm listening to a sermon. I've got German music coming over through this window, and there's a whole bunch of beer being sold out there. We're freed by God to go and enjoy life. Yes, we need to take care of our neighbors. We need to be mindful of our own behavior and to make sure that we're acting out of love. But we are allowed to go and have some fun to celebrate life together, to celebrate. We're loved by God. Let's love one another and celebrate that love in community. So Oktoberfest seems to fit. May we, may we simply, though, allow our hearts to rest in God's mercy this night and then go live. Amen.